I'm Keith Ritzberg. I'm the director of the uh, journal HKU Journalism, the Journalism and Media Studies Center, which is uh, just down the road at Elliott Hall. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, before we start, I also want to thank the uh, Consulate, uh, U.S. General Consulate General of the United States for Hong Kong and Macau, as it's known, um, for sponsoring this event uh, tonight and helping us uh, <coughs> bring over our speaker. Um, before we begin, too, I just ask all of you, if you've got your cell phone, please remember to turn off the sound or turn down the ringer, um, because we love your ringtone, but we don't really need to hear it during the talk. So we're going to have a, a talk uh, for uh, several minutes, maybe 30 or 40 minutes, and then uh, a lot of time for questions from all of you here. And I can see by the size of the crowd that it's a lot of interest in this topic. Uh, the U.S.-China relationship has been perhaps the most important, obviously, in the world the world's largest economy and the second largest economy, the world's rising power, and some would argue the world's waning power. We'll see about that. Uh, but it's a relationship that in many ways defies definition. The US and China, are they friends? Are they enemies? Are they strategic rivals? Are they competitors? Are they geopolitical enemies? Uh, we've got someone here who can help answer, help us navigate that and answer some of those questions. It's, uh, it's our speaker, David Ignatius. Uh, David, since 1998, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, been writing a global affairs column uh, covering all of these issues and more, so you can actually ask him about anything in the world going on. Uh, after a, a stint at the Wall Street Journal, where he covered diplomacy and was the Middle East uh, correspondent and uh, covered everything from the Justice Department to the CIA, he moved in the mid-1980s to the Washington Post, where he's held a variety of jobs including editor of the Sunday Outlook section, that's the opinion and uh, op-ed section. Uh, he was uh, assistant managing editor for business news. He was also foreign editor, um, and a great foreign editor, I can say. And I say that not only because he put my stories on the front page. And uh, he was also editor of the International Herald Tribune in Paris for three years, and we got to share an office for a while and have many great lunches together. And. Uh, and he's had a, a long and storied career, and uh, in addition to, if you think all of that uh, is great, I should also let you know that he's also the author of ten published spy novels, uh, the most recent of which is set in, uh, it's based partly in, I guess, Asia and China and involves the U.S.-China relationship, and one of his earlier books was made into a movie by Ridley Scott, which featured Russell Crowe and Leonardo DiCaprio, so you can also ask about that as well in the Q&A if you'd like. So without further ado, our guest, David Ignatius. I'd especially like to talk about Leonardo DiCaprio, but I don't think uh, you're going to raise that. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here um, uh, in Hong Kong with you. Uh, Bob Gates, who was Secretary of Defense, used to like to say, if you're from Washington, it's wonderful to be anywhere other than Washington. And that feels especially true uh, these days. Uh, it's been an amazing almost week to be here in Hong Kong. Uh, I, felt lucky to be able to see the protest movement close up to talk to lots of young uh, students, to talk to many older uh, Hong Kong officials uh, yesterday afternoon with uh, help from Jennifer Wang, Keith's wonderful assistant, to be able to be out on the streets and see um, that um, protest uh, in its uh, early afternoon flower and its late afternoon uh, version. Uh, so I've come away really learning a lot about what's going on here. Before I get into my uh, central talk about, about the U.S. and China and other foreign policy issues, I just want to uh, briefly say, because it's at the top of my mind and probably um, same for most of you, what my impressions as an outsider landing on your planet were uh, yesterday afternoon, while well, they're still f fresh in my mind, and really while I'm still trying to sort them out. I felt as if I saw three different events yesterday afternoon. The first was a large, peaceful, uh, sort of easygoing march down Hennessy Road. Um, young and old, uh, parents with their little children, um, people chanting, but uh, a sort of freewheeling uh, atmosphere. 
Then uh, Jennifer and I watched uh, for an hour um, from a, a little overpass just uh, past uh, Harcourt Road and the government headquarters as some of the demonstrators kind of gathered for the next stage uh, of the event. Uh, and that, that was really fascinating. Uh, I, I came away with a sense that um, yes, there is this peaceful protest and the demands that people make, but there's been a decision that if you're not more confrontational, if you don't take it to a higher level, uh, the, the message won't really be conveyed. Um, I'm still trying to make up my mind what I think about that, but in that second phase, you saw some young ninja-clad men and women who were determined to be aggressive. Uh, and so just you know, watching those firebombs uh, uh, thrown toward the government complex one after the other and the cheers as some of them landed and fires uh, began to, to burn was, was a very striking image that I'll, that I'll take back. The, the third uh, part of this uh, little trilogy was obviously the police uh, reaction. Uh, initially with the uh, uh, water cannon and tear gas. I was struck by the fact that they were launching tear gas from drones. I don't know whether that came clear in, wasn't drones? It came from the roof of another building. Ah, so I'm, I'm mistaken about that. Thank you, Jennifer, before that found its way incorrectly in a print. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm trying to assess what I thought about the police reaction and then how I put these three parts together. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, talk about this, uh, share in a question uh, your uh, own perspective, I'd find that very welcome, because uh, I'm, as I say, s still trying to get my mind around this. But um, the final thing I want to say is to go to a city like this and hear people chanting about the importance of democracy and freedom uh, in a world where sometimes democracy seems to be in retreat uh, has really been exciting. Uh, I almost want to say exhilarating. Uh, this is, this is a, a world where uh, we worry that these values aren't, aren't prized, that people aren't willing to take risks to hold on to them. And wow, uh, you know, here has been uh, nearly a week for you, 15 weeks uh, of constant reiteration of, of how important uh, people uh, do think. Uh, these these values are so. I, I think that above anything else, that's what I'll I'll take back is that sense that people um, in, in this world where authoritarian government often seems to be on the rise uh, are are feel passionately about their rights and freedoms and are willing to to take unusual actions um, about them. So I want to begin my talk the way I often would begin. Um, uh, lectures when I taught at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, which, I, which I did a few years ago. I still try to go back and teach some classes at, at the Kennedy School. I'm sure most of you know it, but it's you know, a wonderful public policy school. It has many uh, Chinese and some Hong Kong students, I'm sure. But I tried to talk in my, in my lectures about the fog of policy for public policy students. Probably most, most of you are familiar with the famous phrase, the fog of war, from uh, Clausewitz, the German theorist. And he wrote about the way that in battle, in the smoke and chaos of battle, you don't really know where you are on a landscape. You, you can't coordinate your movements. He wrote it's sort of like being in a, in, underwater, that you, you, your limbs move slowly. You just can't connect your desire to move with, with actual movement. And I think that the world of policy is that way too, especially in times like this. It's just hard to know where you are on the landscape, uh, hard to know uh, where the United States itself is, uh, hard to know where our policymaking process is, hard to know what the fundamental factors that are uh, shaping and changing uh, the dynamics in the world are. So, I think we are in this, in this period where it, uh, there's just a lot of uncertainty 
Uh, and, and so many of the things that uh, confuse you as you observe them, I'll just tell you, close up, writing a column twice a week about foreign policy, I, I have the same confusion. I'm in the same uh, fog where I'm just not sure I, I see things uh, clearly. Um, I'm somebody who, who grew up, I was born in 1950, uh, entirely in the world that was shaped after World War II. And so I should begin this conversation by saying that uh, what uh, Dean Acheson described in his memoirs, you know, aptly titled, Present at the Creation, I felt I lived in a world in which the United States was defined by a network of relationships that we'd built around the world after 1945, defined by a series of institutions, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, most obviously, but also NATO and our alliances in, in Asia. All of these um, elements made up a world of pretty forward-leaning, expansionist American policy. It sometimes led us into serious mistakes like the Vietnam War, but, but that basic framework uh, through most of my lifetime seemed um, solid. It was at the center of American foreign policy, uh, of American uh, prosperity. Uh, other countries like China, it seemed for the first uh, half of, of my life as a journalist, eager to follow in the wake of that powerful uh, American um, uh, movement th uh, through the world. Um, when Donald Trump was elected president, uh, I, I wrote that uh, I wondered if we were present at the destruction. In other words, were we seeing a deliberate effort um, to dismantle that order? We often call it the liberal international order. And I think that um, three years on, the answer is pretty obviously yes, um, that that is his desire. He sums it up in the phrase, America first, but, but it really is more broadly a rejection of the idea that American prosperity, uh, American values, uh, America, the interests of the average American person were enhanced by this internationalism, this desire to be the leader of other countries, sometimes to make sacrifices, to have trade uh, deals and other alliances that as he's always complaining, you know, we ended up paying but more than our fair share. Why doesn't, why doesn't Germany pay more for its defense? Why doesn't Japan pay more for our troops? That, on down the list, the sense that the, this old order uh, fundamentally uh, misserved um, American interests. I, I don't believe that. Um, everything in my own life and my experience overseas has told me that um, the interests of America as a whole, um, uh, and certainly our foreign policy interests, have been served by this structure uh, of alliances, network through which we exercise power. But there is a revolt against it, and it's not just uh, President Trump. Uh, it was striking during the 2016 campaign that Hillary Clinton was uh, as sharp in her criticism of what was planned as the next phase of this internationalism, the, the trade uh, agreements uh, known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as Donald Trump was. I, I, I couldn't understand it. I can remember some just ferocious uh, conversations, public questions of her closest campaign advisors. You know, why is she doing this? Does she really think she'll get a single vote uh, from publicly rejecting a trade agreement that everybody knows she fundamentally supports. But I think the answer of why she did that is that she was afraid of a country uh, where uh, clearly many voters, uh, certainly most working class voters, uh, felt that these agreements simply weren't in, in their interest. And so she was uh, pulling, pulling back from them. So um, that uh, sense of, of public frustration, uh, anger, uh, all of the residue uh, of, the, of the past several decades in America, notably the economic crash of 2008-9 that the country is still trying to absorb, the frustration that people feel about um, endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that 
don't end up producing security for the country. And the more fundamental disorientation that I think began with September 11, 2001, all those things have fed into what we call America First, this a very disruptive foreign policy of, of, uh, of Donald Trump. Just mentioned uh, before I, I begin to talk about the US-China side of this, something that my father told me after 9-11. Uh, my dad is now 98, so you have to take what he says seriously, because if you're 98, you earn, earn that. Uh, but he said, you know, Dave, um, sometimes um, the world is like a top that's spinning on a table. And as we all know if, uh, from looking at tops, um, if a top is spinning fast, you can give it a good knock, and it'll be, begin to wobble, but it'll come back pretty quickly to the center point. If the top is spinning more slowly, it doesn't have that you know, motion and momentum, give it a knock and it'll begin to wobble more and more, and the amplitude of the wobbles will be greater and greater, and pretty soon it'll just fall over. And I think uh, his point uh, a after this catastrophic event that hit America uh, was that our top wasn't really spinning fast enough for us to recover quite as fast as we wanted. So I've felt, as somebody writing about foreign policy, that there's been more wobble. Uh, we fortunately haven't fallen right over onto the table, and I don't think that we will. But I think my dad's analogy to the spinning top is, uh, is, is helpful. And so when I think about, about politics, at the end of my talk, I want to talk about the 2020 election. I think about how to put more spin on the top. What would be policies and personalities that would get us moving faster in the same direction? Uh, because I think that's uh, the basics of what we need. So um, let me talk about the U.S.-China relationship in this age of America first. I have to say, you know, in the age of America first, it's not surprising that it's also the age of China first. Uh, as we're seeing in Britain, it's the age of Britain first. Um, you could argue in the, you know, it's the age of Hong Kong first. Hong Kongers are saying, you know, we're going to look after our interests. That, that uh, nationalism, a sort of sharper definition of individual countries' self-interest um, is an inevitable consequence of the leader of the global system deciding that it's, it's going to have uh, that uh, same uh, emphasis. But what uh, we're seeing now, what I spent much of the summer uh, examining, is that the old consensus about U.S.-China relations, about the nature of that relationship, is shattered. It's gone. Uh, I think you probably know that. Uh, it's probably something that you discuss often in your international relations classes. But I'll just tell you, as somebody who goes to a lot of events where the foreign policy elite sits and discusses uh, US and China, uh, that has become a consensus every bit as much as the old uh, idea of engagement with China uh, was the consensus through, think of all the presidents and prominent advisors through Nixon and Carter and Clinton and you know, go, down, go down the list. The figures I, I think of as being the embodiments of that old idea that engagement with China, China's rise, China's prosperity, will be good for the United States. Um, the list begins with Henry Kissinger, uh, who really opened the modern relationship. But all of his successors as national security advisor basically believe the same thing. So Big Nick Brzezinski, with whom I wrote a book called America and the World, uh, it was a book with him and Brent Scowcroft, the two in some ways most powerful followers of, of Henry Kissinger, it, it, emphasized again and again the importance of maintaining uh, the continuity of our relationship with China, this expectation, as I always like to put it, that, that free markets in China would make for free Chinese men and women. 
It was that assumption that the, this increasingly complex, sophisticated, rich Chinese economy couldn't be managed by the Chinese Communist Party. It just wouldn't be possible. And so as a kind of inevitable process, there'd be a, there'd be a change. The party's ability to control things would weaken, uh, and we'd eventually see not a convergence, but, a, but changes in China that would make this process uh, benign. That's the uh, confidence that used to exist that's now basically disappeared. You know, you could say that Xi Jinping's biggest accomplishment uh, is that he's changed American ex expectations about what's possible for the Chinese Communist Party. He has been successful in managing this enterprise. Uh, for analysts like me, he keeps surprising on the upside in his ability to conduct what's now been a purge of an entire generation of the party, his purge of pretty much an entire generation of the PLA leadership. I mean, you know, since coming in, since launching the uh, anti-corruption uh, drive with his colleague Wang Kishan, he's taken down, I once, uh, with help, counted up the numbers. I mean, it's in the tens of thousands of people who've been dismissed from their jobs, who've been replaced, who are now uh, uh, Xi uh, uh, people. So as Americans look at, at this, change their expectations of what the Chinese Communist Party can do, uh, change their expectations about what Chinese military power might look like, um, there is a struggle to define an alternative to what this old consensus, uh, this, the simple term for it would be engagement, because that's what it was about. And uh, Two conferences this summer, which had just about every member of our foreign policy establishment, all the former secretaries of state and national security advisors, I listened to a, a searching discussion about what should replace this idea that everybody shared. Uh, what's the right way to think about the U.S.-China relationship? Is it managed competition? Is it rivalry? Um, uh, what are the points at which it could become something closer to confrontation? Uh, what are the dangers? What are the opportunities? Just down the list. Um, at each of these conferences, we concluded without uh, clear answers. I quoted uh, a White House China advisor saying that in the White House discussions in the Trump administration, when they're trying to you know, talk about this new approach to China and they can't think of what to call it, they just call it the noun because it's going to have some name. They just don't know what it is, so they call it the noun. Um, but there, there is something uh, coming. Um, and I, I, I have, I think it's inevitable, but I have concerns that the costs uh, for the United States, for its allies, and for China could be significant. And I'll, I'll talk uh, a, little, a little bit about that. Um, let me just note, although, as I say, you can't yet describe what this you know, managed competition will look like, I'll note uh, three basic elements. First is a recognition that probably for the first time uh, in its history, certainly it's in its history since the Second World War and American dominance, the United States now has a genuine peer competitor. The Soviet Union was powerful in terms of its nuclear weapons. It was uh, noisy in terms of its rhetoric. But it was never fundamentally a, a threat or a, a peer competitor to the United States. Anybody who traveled in the old Soviet Union could see in an instant how backward the Russian economy was, how inefficient it was at providing services for its people, uh, even simple things like, like food. Uh, China, in the future, is going to be a rich, a dynamic economy. The commanding heights of technology are, are where she has set his sights. Uh, I go back to the speech that he made at the party plenum, um, I'm thinking it was 2017, in which he you know, literally went down the list of technologies that will be decisive in the future. Artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, cloud computing. 
and said in each area China will seek to be the dominant provider of this technology. I think initially a lot of American analysts didn't take that all that seriously, saw it as a kind of rhetorical effort by Xi to take greater command of the party, but there's been a growing recognition uh, that um, Chinese accomplishments in these technological areas are significant. I heard the, the former head of one of America's largest tech companies say to one of these foreign policy audiences, if you saw what I see when I travel to China, you'd realize that in every area that my gigantic company cares about, China now is in a position to threaten our leadership in the industry. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that's from, again, I, I wish I was at liberty to identify the person, but you can imagine this is, this is a big company, uh, and I, I, I took that seriously. So that would be the first element. For the first time, we face a real peer competitor. Second, I think part of this new consensus is that President Trump, no matter what you think about him, and as you'll hear and as you know if you read my column, I'm not, not his biggest fan, he was right about the importance of taking a firmer line with China about trade and other issues. There, there simply has been an unequal trade relationship uh, with China that China's been able to exploit to great advantage and the things that you hear from American corporate executives are, you know, what they steal are intellectual property. They, every way they can, they try to take it and copy it and then they're competing with us and selling it cheaper and now sometimes uh, better. There's a feeling that American companies have not had equal market access. Uh, that American capital has been constrained. There was hope of having a bilateral investment treaty that would make for a, uh, an even playing field, as people say. Well, that, that, that never happened. It's been a casualty of the change of, uh, of administration. So um, it's hard to find a prominent Democrat when you're talking in private about foreign policy who doesn't say, basically, Trump was right to um, be tougher. It doesn't mean that people agree with all the decisions about tariffs, and it, it certainly doesn't mean they agree with all the bumping up and down, the you know, tweets and, and statements that are all over it. Indeed, if there's one criticism that you hear from these same people who say he was right to take a tougher line, it's that this administration lacks a clear strategy for the um, process that it's begun by taking that firmer line. The third point of agreement, and you could argue that this isn't really about China, but I think it, it does go to the heart of what this new consensus is about, is that no external threat that China might pose is as potentially damaging as the internal threat the United States faces from the decay and often dysfunction of its political system. We are a country that's having real difficulty making decisions about things that people care about. You know, you all read the news from the U.S. and, and, and you read about uh, incredibly nasty political battles, a you know, president calling members of the press enemies of the people, saying terrible things about uh, members of Congress whose uh, heritage is, is from uh, Know, the, the Middle East or, or, or Africa. I mean, you know, we, we are that country and that dysfunction and the way it's feeding through our national life. I think uh, there's a growing understanding that's the national security threat that's really uh, important and that um, we won't have any hope of really being an effective competitor with China or with anybody else until we address those problems. So I, you know, because I hear this over and over again from elite audiences, I'm encouraged that people are, are finally taking this, this uh, uh, problem uh, seriously. So as you look at this uh, reevaluation of US-China relations that I'm describing, 
and I'm going to talk in a minute about the military dimensions of this. One question that you can ask um, is whether Xi Jinping moved too soon to declare China's Made in China 2025 ambition to be such a dominant player uh, in the region and, and in the world economy. Um, because the effect of that, as, as Americans processed it, was to create antibodies, if you will. You know, people got worried. And they began to take uh, actions that are going to have consequences. Um, and and uh, I've, I've heard it said that in, in Chinese debates, uh, even within the party, this question is one that people sometimes ask. Um, did, did, did she cause problems for himself by walking into a confrontation with Trump over trade, for example, that's going to be a tough one that, that, that may affect the rate of growth of China, that may affect many other dimensions of power. Wouldn't it have been easier just to kind of let things, you know, the old Chinese approach in foreign policy was described as a, in the phrase that Deng Xiaoping used, hide and bide. In other words, don't make your power, your ambition too obvious. Just kind of keep it, um, keep it as quiet as possible. Don't make trouble for yourself. Um, you know, was she um, mistaken in moving away from that? That's, that's a, a question that I, that I hear a lot. Um, at one of the conferences that I attended this summer at the University of California at San Diego that, that had m most of the prominent American experts on China. We also had a number of Chinese uh, guests, uh, people from think tanks and other um, quasi-official, let's say, uh, voices from China. And one of them said during our conversations uh, something that really has stayed with me. And I'll share with this audience, because I think the implications of it uh, are, are huge. He said, in, in Beijing, we think we're probably heading toward a partial decoupling of the United States and China in technology and economic relations. When you think about what a partially decoupled world would look like, uh, that's pretty disturbing. I mean, we now have a world that is so knit together in terms of trade, finance, um, every element of, of global commerce. It, you know, it's a globalized economy. That's a cliche, but, but it really is knit pretty tight. And if you begin to pull at those seams and partially decouple, a lot of things would be much more difficult to maintain. Supply chains uh, are one example. I, I was thinking this week, uh, as I was here in Hong Kong, about what the consequences of a partially decoupled global economy would be for Hong Kong. Do you, does Hong Kong get pulled into a Chinese sphere of influence dramatically so that its life as an entrepot, as the French say, uh, this international trading capital becomes different. What happens to other uh, Southeast Asian, uh, Asian uh, countries and, and economies? It's in part because I think these consequences would be so significant and because I think globalization is so far advanced, I've come to think that this partial decoupling is less likely than my Chinese friends said at the conference. I think there's going to be some of that. There are going to be some national security decisions about companies like Huawei um, that you know, may have the, some elements of separation. But I, I think the, the idea of a real decoupling, um, I'd, be, I'd be surprised if, if that happened. I just want to note a book that had a lot of influence on me as I thought about what uh, separation might mean in technology. Um, especially as we enter a world where uh, the dominant technology um, will be, you know, as it spreads through every business, will be artificial intelligence. This is a book called The Big Nine by a woman named Amy Webb, who's a futurologist, she calls herself. A very brilliant woman who teaches uh, 
in New York. Uh, and she looks at the nine leading companies that are in the AI space. Three of them are Chinese, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent. Six of them are American. You know, they're the obvious uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, uh, Apple. So um, if uh, in the AI uh, space, uh, for national security reasons, there is some attempt to separate, uh, Amy's point is that you may end up having, at least in that part of the global economy, separate spheres of influence. There will be a kind of commercial economic ecosystem that spins around the Chinese companies uh, as they move forward, and another that spins around the American companies. They'll, they'll uh, have exchanges, but, but it will be, again, not a decoupled world, but a world of different uh, technological spheres of influence. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating uh, concept. Uh, part of Amy's argument is that in AI, as she puts it, um, China is the OPEC of data because China captures so much data about literally every movement, every, you know, I mean, if you just, just do machine learning on, you know, what, what happens when people blink their eyes and what comes next and, you know, what um, actions follow certain words and you know, run that through you know, billions of iterations and you're going to have powerful systems. You know, the, China's the OPEC of data. Uh, they're, they're just no American company, even in that, that big six, is able to, to uh, have the same data for its AI systems to learn on. So it's part of the argument. Be careful about, about this, about this, uh, this uh, separation. So. Um, I said I wanted to talk a little bit about the military uh, side of this. Um, obviously, uh, on issues like this, there's only so much that I uh, know about, about, about military uh, matters. But let me just note some of the things that, that people um, uh, talk about. First, um, for, the, for the military, which likes planning, uh, likes this, this time horizon where you can kind of you know, figure out where you go next and next and next. Uh, for a military that, to be honest, was distracted by the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, the shock of China's emergence as a, as a country that really can project power um, is uh, important to understand uh, as, a, as a factor. And it's just, just purely this sort of, oh my gosh, people coming out of these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and waking up to the reality of what a powerful China had emerged, in a sense, while they were looking elsewhere. So I think that's, that's the first important point. Second that American officials will often talk about is that uh, President Obama felt that he was deliberately misled by Xi Jinping about whether China would militarize the South China Sea. Uh, when she visited Washington, there's a famous meeting they had in the Rose Garden, and uh, Obama administration officials say that President Xi promised that he would not militarize the South China Sea. So when these islands emerged you know, from what used to be pieces of sand, and they had air, airfields on them, and then they had you know, radars on them, and then they were basically military bases, there was a feeling among officials in the Obama administration that that, that, that would have been a deliberate um, effort, and it left very, very um, uh, hard feelings, especially among people in the U.S. military who'd been worried about this, who'd been warning about it, and then suddenly here was this uh, reality that they were concerned about. A third uh, point that I hear every time I talk to, to uh, senior military officials is that the Chinese have been very smart um, in developing weapons that deal with the way America projects power. Their so-called area denial, access denial weapons, but basically they're weapons that render uh, an aircraft carrier task force, which is the way America's always loved to, to project power in the world, um, enormously vulnerable in the days when the US could 
sail an aircraft carrier task force into the Taiwan Strait as a show of strength, but also as a way of projecting power, that's pretty much over. I mean, that aircraft carrier task force would be vulnerable to Chinese precision weapons uh, from early in its voyage. Similarly, American bases in places like Okinawa uh, that used to be the, the jumping off spots for projecting power in, in Asia uh, are, again, much more vulnerable. I think uh, as much as uh, the vulnerability of those traditional uh, weapon systems, the vulnerability of our space-based systems, I mean, America's ability to project power depends to an extent people don't often think about uh, on these satellites in space that pass the information around the world to American uh, uh, commands. So the, the sense that dawned 10 years or so ago that those space-based systems were vulnerable to uh, very aggressive Chinese efforts to develop weapons, that really um, kind of shock people in the military. I mentioned artificial intelligence. Um, you know, the military national security area understands that that's going to be at the center of warfare as it is of every aspect of, of, of life. So uh, what is, how's the military responded? Just the way you'd expect. Um, China is the driver now if you're trying to get more money for your the Air Force or the Navy or any, you know, our, so, you know, you're, uh, the, these chiefs are out there uh, talking to Congress about the new weapons projects that they have that will deal with this new uh, peer competitor in, in China. So, um, again, at the end of a summer where I talked to many uh, uh, generals uh, and admirals as well as, as foreign policy experts about China, I just want to summarize for you um, what this debate feels like uh, in Washington. It's, I don't know yet where it's, where it's going, um, but I just I want you to, to understand it. So I'm going to just make a few more comments, Jennifer, and then I want to open this up to, to questions from this audience. I really hope we can have a, a very lively um, discussion. Um, I want to make a point about how Donald Trump operates in foreign policy. In the beginning, he basically just was mystifying to people. You know, his idea was, you know, disrupt, tweet, uh, overturn whatever had been the established policy, and, and he made everybody dizzy. Certainly made me, me dizzy. Uh, the only thing that was reassuring was he seemed to have people around him who were pretty traditional, solid. Uh, General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, as an example. Uh, I could list other people in the administration. So there was this idea that while there are adults in the room, things will be taken care of. Um, but I think more and more uh, President Trump uh, came to believe that his approach was effective, that it worked. The prime example of that is North Korea. I don't agree with this, but, but you know I think if we had him up here to make one of his uh, talks, he would he would say that, you know, he began by by uh, you know making clear threats about the America's willingness to use military force. That was a period when he talked about fire and fury, seemed to be actually threatening that he might uh, uh, use military action against North Korea. That was accompanied by economic sanctions. You know, massive uh, pressure is what Trump likes to call it. Um, and then it, it was pretty soon followed by personal diplomacy. Uh, the series of summits that Trump has held with Kim Jong-un in which he's talked about my dear friend, dear leader, you know, my partner. Um, if you look at other major uh, foreign policy issues, you'll find the same basic pattern. It's there with China. Uh, start with disruption, uh, move into a kind of economic sanctions process, uh, in this case tariffs, but keep holding out the, the prospect of this intense personal diplomacy. Uh, I quoted a White House official uh, a week or so ago as saying, you can su summarize President Trump's China, China policy in four words. She is my friend. I mean, 
That's, he comes back to that again and again. He's my friend. I like him. We, we like each other. We get along. And so there's a, this idea that you know, he's just irresistible, that he, he thinks he can sit down with people. The latest version of this, obviously, has been Iran. He has seemed convinced that you know, if he just sits down with President Rouhani, um, you know, they, he always will say things like, they're dying to talk. You know, they really want to talk. I'm not sure I want to talk, but they want to talk. Um, there was the latest statement today from the Iranians that no, they don't want to talk. They have absolutely no intention of meeting with President Trump at the General Assembly in New York, which Trump's people have, have all but, but been uh, predicting. So you know that's the basic. You want to know what the, the, the pattern is for this mystifying president. That's it. It's, and, and he thinks it works. He does it again and again. Final point to make about him, and then I think I'll save comments about our elections for, for your questions. Um, President Trump has entered the campaign season, uh, as, as most Americans have. And the implication of that to me is, for foreign policy is pretty significant. The first obvious point is that he doesn't want a war. He knows that America is sick of wars overseas. Um, it's why you know, he's gone right up to the edge. He's basically declared an economic <laughs> war on Iran. But he's been very allergic to taking military action. You know, he, the military had given him a list of targets to attack after the Iranians knocked down our surveillance drone, and he didn't do it. And that was, that was his decision. Don't, I mean, he, he does make, uh, make, make these decisions. He doesn't want the stock market to crash. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't want a recession. But even more, I think, he, you know, because he's a kind of New York Wall Street guy, he doesn't want to see the, the, the Dow fall 5,000 points. Or, you know, and, you know, that's certainly possible over the next 12 months. And he'll do a lot to prevent that from happening. There's a lot of sugar he can still pump into the economy. That's why he keeps uh, you know, hammering the poor Federal Reserve Chairman, Jay Powell, to lower interest rates. I mean, he, he won't be satisfied until interest rates are minus 2%. Um, and, and he doesn't want any failure of a major initiative. I think that's why he keeps sort of pumping air into the North Korea process, even though it's pretty clear it's not going anywhere. He doesn't want that to, to be seen to collapse. So you know, that's, you know, that's where he is. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that we'll see major changes in any of those areas um, uh, as we head toward elections. You, know, you, you never can tell. We could suddenly be, have a flashpoint with, with Iran, most obviously. Here's Iran, it seems, through its proxies, torching Saudi oil refineries. That was a you know, huge uh, risk-taking effort by, by, by Iran, if, if, that, if that accusation is correct. So I uh, don't want to make any certain predictions. So I'm going to turn this to, to questions again. I'd in, invite um, brief questions. Um, if you feel like briefly saying who you are, that makes it easier for me um, to, to respond. Um, and please don't make speeches. Um, and I'll try to answer as many as I can and call on you if you just would raise your hands. Yes, yes, sir. I was afraid nobody was going to raise their hands. We all go home early. Uh, Glenn Jive in the Fulbright program here in Omaha. Um, I'd like to ask a question. But first, to say, write great columns to say that it's a fog. I mean, uh, you make a lot of things clear, so uh, thank you for that on an ongoing basis. Um, a question about the trade process and the deal that Trump can make. What, using the, what you described as the path, uh, how is he going to get out of this, you know, before the election process in which he can declare victory? Uh, or do you think this is going to stay open and unresolved uh, well into the campaign season and, uh, and continue the as it were, the decoupling process that the trade war has opened. Thank you. So I, I do think he, he wants a deal. Um, uh, you know, the, he's in an interesting phase of the bargaining, which is in part um, 
which economy, the US or Chinese, is more threatened by a continuation of these trade difficulties? Um, you know, it's, it, there, there's some of the, you know, you're in worse shape than we are. No, 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 you're in worse shape. Um, I thought uh, when he uh, delayed the application of this last uh, additional round of tariffs, he was dropping the hanky, you know, uh, in the novel, the coy maiden drops the hanky. And the, so I, I, thought, I thought that was telling us that, that something was on the way. And then the Chinese have responded in kind by buying additional agricultural, uh, you know, more soybeans. And you know, there have been a series of these, you know, phasing maneuvers. Liu He is coming to Washington, I believe, in uh, early October. Um, the financial markets have already baked in the idea there's going to be some kind of settlement. So if there isn't, I mean, we've already had a significant uptick, and the, you know, the uh, markets are leading indicators. So if nothing happens, if we go back to the, um, he'll pay a, a, a price in terms of the financial market uh, reaction. The question that I hear people talking about in Washington uh, is whether Trump, in his eagerness to get something he can call a victory. And China clearly um, is willing to give him what will look like a victory on agricultural products. You know, there'll be some huge number. Uh, on overall terms of trade, there'll be a promise to, you know, adjustment of the trade balance, something that will look like a great big number. I think what China is concerned about uh, is the Huawei threat to cut off US and allied technology for some, some key companies um, where China, for all its technological uh, growth, you know, still um, really needs what it, what it buys from American and, and Taiwanese, frankly, companies. I mean, China's ability to make the most advanced chips on which its systems depend, I, I'm told, is just way behind. Um, and, and so, Trump gets pressure from his national security advisors to make sure, don't you compromise on Huawei. They think that's cr crucial. Trump has signaled at various points that he's willing to compromise. You know, you remember, remember when there was the ZTE standoff, Trump, again, to the consternation of his national security team, uh, you know, my friend Xi, uh, his, his core foreign policy, <coughs> Uh, uh, tenant, he, he ended up, you know, President Xi has personally asked me to, you know, remove these sanctions on ZT, and so I'm doing it for my friend, my friend Xi. So I, you know, you'd have to, again, looking at, at past performance, you'd have to guess that he would um, partially remove the Huawei. I think particularly that they don't want um, Madam, the woman who's, who's still in prison, and I think the idea of her going to trial uh, I think there's something the Chinese really would like to avoid. And, and, uh, so anyway, I, I think there will be a deal because the economic price for him of not having one will be significant. I think it's one that will have all these attributes of success but may compromise the thing that national security people most want him to hold tight on. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the great talk. So I feel like you described the consensus of the U.S.-China relationship before. It's like U.S. people or U.S. allies think it's a positive sound game, if we put it simply. And now it's more like narrow sound game or even negative sound game. So if in the worst scenario, you know, U.S. suffers, China also suffers, but you, U.S. can stop China no matter from its technology development or just, you know, slow the process. Will it be worth it, or will the U.S. allies or the U.S. public be approving of that? So that's a really uh, good question, and you know, smartly uh, phrased in terms of, of game theory, because I think that's a you know an interesting uh, way to to think about this. Um, before I became a, a journalist, I wanted to be an economist, so I had the economist's belief that uh, you know, the law of comparative advantage, that you know, countries trade because you, know, you can make something more efficiently than I can, and the benefit, my, the welfare of my 
consumers and my overall economic health is improved by buying it from you instead of trying to make it myself. And you know, through international trade, it is the, it's a positive sum game. Everybody gains. And I would say, uh, contrary to um, you know, so many of Trump's advisors, that this period of uh, Chinese economic, incredible Chinese economic growth, it's the, the biggest story of my lifetime, is China's growth into this dynamic economy, has overall been beneficial for the United States too. The, the idea that this was you know, a, 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 a game in which they won and we lost, I just, I don't believe that. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, the, this partial decoupling scenario, this idea of walling off parts of the economy um, is likely to make both sides worse off than they were before. That's, that's my own judgment, you know, in terms of my economics training, but, but also my, my intuition about, about how the global economy works. Global supply chains, the way in which they've been, you know, interlaced, you know, through China, Mexico, countries in Europe, you know, all converging to, to put those products together. I have a daughter, one of my three daughters is now in business school. And she started her, her first year, they took the first year class, first to Washington, then to Barcelona, then to Shanghai, then to Beijing. And the idea was, let's see how this integrated global economy looks from the ground up uh, so that we can be effective uh, managers. I hope they're preparing for the world that exists, which is still integrated in those ways. Um, and I'd hate to see you know, the, 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 the negative sum game emerge. Um, I, as I said earlier in my talk, I don't think that's likely. Uh, yes, sir. I can, I can, you say the question, I'll repeat it. You know, the, the Taiwan question is, I think, um, one we'll all be thinking more and more about uh, over the next uh, few years. I hope it doesn't lead to a, a real confrontation and crisis, but I wouldn't rule that out. I was in Taiwan you know, within the last six months and spent a good long while with President Tsai Ing-wen. I have to say I was very impressed with her. Um, much as I feel um, you know, on Hennessy Road listening to people talk about you know, freedom and, and democracy and their rights as Hong Kongers, listening to her and other Taiwanese talk about wanting to have a free society, wanting to uh, you know, live their lives, um, not wanting to be subjugated as a province of China. I mean, it's, it's pretty powerful to, to hear that. And they've been willing to take risks to do that. The Taiwanese economy is as dynamic as, as the rest of the Chinese economy. It's, it's really something to see, as I'm sure you, you know. Um, so there is an emotional um, sense of support that Americans feel for Taiwanese. They don't want to uh, you know, let them down. Um, I think the idea that America should go to war on behalf of Taiwan is, is not something that, that, that most Americans would support. Um, so you say, we, you know, this isn't our war. Our ability to send 
as I said earlier, send an aircraft carrier task force to the Taiwan Strait, which literally happened during uh, President Clinton's time, that, that's, that's not, um, that, that's not a, a workable scenario now. So you'd say, well, let's help Taiwan be a little stronger itself to make the cost of trying to invade Taiwan, conquer Taiwan militarily, uh, more than China would want to, um, to pay. So I assume that's, that's the, the argument. Um, I think you're right to raise the kind of basic, um, you know, s skeptical, cynical point. Isn't this about selling weapons and making money for, for U.S. Uh, arms companies? Sure. I mean, you know, those, those deals always are that way. Um, I came away from, from Taiwan thinking that to think about this struggle in terms of conventional military power, um, you know, the, the weapons of 30 years ago is a mistake. That, you know, much as Russia's operations against Ukraine have been in the semi-deniable gray zone, we call it hybrid warfare, they've been influence operations, cyber operations, operations by proxy forces, and that seems to me a much more likely scenario for how China would seek to achieve its goals in, in bringing this renegade province, as the Chinese sometimes say, under, under better control. The idea that they would send, you know, launch an invasion across the Taiwan Strait, that would be a really difficult campaign. I'm sure China could win in the long run, but it would, it would not be an easier pleasant one. So that's the way I, I've tended to look at it. I think sometimes we're, we're just looking in the wrong space when we think about, about how this is going to play out. Um, but uh, again, I just would reiterate that uh, for Americans, Taiwan is a kind of emotional issue, much as Hong Kong is. We just admire people whenever we hear people you know, inv invoke uh, values of freedom and democracy. That, you know, Americans just kind of feel sympathy for that, and they want to be supportive. Yes. Uh, I'm Robin Hibbert, and I'm a master's in journalism student. Um, you've mentioned that foreign policy in the U.S. Um, or in the Trump administration White House is in disarray. I wonder if you could maybe speculate uh, a little bit about if there was a Democratic president elected in the next election. Um, do you think they would be able to bring it into some semblance of order? And do you have any speculation on what it might look like? Well, those are, those are good questions. Um, so, so just in terms of the basic structure of national security decision making, yes. I mean, that structure is our National Security Council, the interagency meetings at different layers, um, starting with assistant secretaries, and then there's what they call the deputies committee, which is deputy secretaries, which does planning, and then the principals committee, which is the secretaries. I mean, those meetings basically have stopped happening. Um, the, the process, when I say it's, it's you know, broken, I, I literally mean it, it, they just don't meet. Um, John Bolton ran things out of his back pocket. Um, uh, who knows who will replace him? But the thing that we've really learned is that Donald Trump wants to run his own foreign policy. You, 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 I, mean, I mean, in a sense, what's the point of having all those meetings if the president is just kind of going to get up one morning and say, you know, I do want to meet with President Rouhani. Well, sir, you know, we've said all the reasons why that's not a good idea. Well, I want to. So I think that's um, just the reality. So I think any um, Democratic president would rebuild the basic um, structure. Uh, you'd have a strong national security advisor. Hopefully, you'd have good relations with the president. The queue of prospective national security advisors, secretaries of state for a democratic administration practically winds around the block. I mean, you know, they, there are so many good, smart people who are just can't wait to do this. They're very close, most of them, to Biden. You know, if we, it was President Elizabeth Warren, I'm not so sure who would be. Secretary of State or National Security Advisor, but you know, I think Warren, uh, most Democrats other than Biden, is going to want to concentrate on domestic economics, and you, they might well say, let's just put 
foreign policy and the tradition might be exactly the same cast of characters you'd have in a Biden administration, because Elizabeth Warren would say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to fix, I'm going to do my health care thing, I'm going to fix the economy, et cetera. So um, in terms of policies, you know, I think um, there's likely to be more continuity than change in China policy. As I tried to say earlier, there is a new consensus emerging. I can't describe exactly what the details are, but I, I sort of feel it coming, and I, I don't think that it, the Democrats will be significantly different. I think on Iran, you know, I, think, I think most Democrats thought the Iran nuclear agreement was good. Um, it's going to be tough now to go back to that uh, world, so it'll be JCPOA plus um, with the Democrat. But, um, you know, I, I, I think most Democrats think the old national security architecture basically was beneficial. They'll try to sell it better to a country that's obviously really skeptical about it. Uh, but, I, but I think you could, would, could expect to sort of turn back toward traditional themes and policies. Yes, ma'am. So I kind of had a question about, I guess, just global American relations. Um, the American first mentality hasn't just affected our relationship with China. It's also you know, affected our relationship with Europe. As our president has pulled us out of the Paris Accord and leveraged tariffs against some European countries. So I was wondering if you could speculate about what you think our relationship with Europe will look like if there's a democratic president or just going forward with the current administration. So uh, again, I, uh, like all the questions, that's, that's a really uh, good one. Um, I probably should have said in my own uh, remarks that when I look at the real cost of the Trump uh, presidency, the damage done to our traditional alliances, especially in Europe, but elsewhere too, may be the biggest cost of all. Europeans really have been stunned by um, Trump's statements his deliberate, gratuitous uh, insults to European leaders. Um, you know, Germany, which has been a, a, a solid, um, generally uh, reliable ally, you know, it's just like, I think people are, they can't believe it. They just don't get it. Um, you know, go down the list, you know, whether it's um, Denmark and, you know, what do you mean you won't sell us Greenland? Uh, there are just such, such strange things. Um, and I think the, the, the problem for the Europeans, as one of them said to me, um, is um, you tell us that if President Biden or some Democrat is elected, you'll go back to, you know, we'll have reversion of the mean and you go back to the traditional policies. But you, you know, we never thought Trump was possible, and if Trump could get elected even once, um, that means that America may be different as a country than we thought it was. So I think it's, it's you know, is, is America reliable as a partner? Is there some deep um, uneasiness, unhappiness in America that's propelled Trump's election that's going to continue and continue to be? So I, I, what I see... Uh, in Europe, um, I even see this among the Gulf countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, is increasingly hedging um, against this America in retreat or you know just in um, in a very different stance. So um, a, a friend who's a, the UAE ambassador to Washington, who I quoted a year ago probably saying, you're always asking me what the new Middle East is going to look like. Well, open your eyes. It's already here. And he noted that uh, on the day that he said this to me, President Xi Jinping was in Abu Dhabi, uh, in part of the increasingly close Chinese-UAE dialogue. The Saudi-Chinese uh, dialogue similarly is close. He noted that uh, Bibi Netanyahu had been in Moscow more times that year than he'd been in Washington. Uh, the Israeli-Russian uh, diplomacy is much more intense. Their, their di diplomatic, military, intelligence relationship doesn't get written about much, but it's pretty intense. 
So in all these ways, countries are hedging. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's going to continue. It'll, it'll, it'll change if there's a Democrat back in the White House, but it won't disappear. Let me go in the back. Yes, the gentleman there with his hand up. And then, ma'am. Oh, yes, then you. I can just talk really loudly. Good. I mean, you, you, mentioned the, you mentioned kind of what the views of the, for lack of a better word, foreign policy elite. You think what Ben Rhodes rather uh, disregarded as the Bloc. About I am a charter, charter member of the Bloc. Yeah. So the, the question is kind of, we, we talked about their views, but I guess insofar as the American public thinks about this, do we have any information about what their views are? We can probably assume they're not fans of China, but they're not fans of terrorists either, and young people seem to like trade more. What, what information do we have about what, what the American public thinks about? Um, there are polls that are done by the Pew Research Center, um, in particular the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, um, that, that tend to show that uh, Americans, according to the, the polling data are more engaged, more internationalist, uh, more forward-leaning than you'd think um, looking at the kind of nationalism and, and, and neo-populism in both parties, or at least what people uh, see as, as that. That, that America, Americans, when polled, are, you know, still see their future uh, abroad. And, that, and that, that's more true the younger um, the respondents are. So younger Americans get it. They live in the world. They have to uh, be, be, be active. It's always hard for me to interpret those numbers. One thing that I, that I do believe is that um, international engagement, these sort of traditional uh, values of foreign policy have become too identified with the coastal elites. It's too much uh, Boston, New York, Washington, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle phenomenon. Uh, I, I've written often that the uh, heyday of American internationalism was what I like to call the internationalism of the heartland, where the, the exponents of these values were people like William Fulbright from Arkansas, and Walter Mondale from uh, Minnesota, and uh, Richard Luger from Indiana, and go down a list. I mean, you'll find some of the people you most associate with this uh, internationalist foreign policy were not from the coastal elites, but, but from the heart of the country. And so that gave a, a power um, to the message that I think has been, has been lacking. You know, Hillary Clinton, you know, Strange, Bill Clinton was, was from the heartland, but he sure became, managed to seem in people's minds to become a creature of the, of the coastal elites, and, and Hillary even more so. So, you know, I, I, I'd love to see, that's one reason Pete Buttigieg is such an interesting candidate. He's super articulate, a real exponent of international involvement, Rhodes Scholar, got a first at Oxford when he was a Rhodes Scholar, He's super smart. Uh, you know, but he's the mayor of a, of a, of a town in, uh, in uh, Indiana, Indiana, I think, yeah? So, you know, internationalism of heartland is my line. Uh, when I say that, I, th I think it, it just sounds like such a PR, you know, it's like, is that really believable? But uh, I think that's when it would be stronger. Um, your point, you know, is the public really as happy with all this stuff as, you, David, blob member, you know, card-carrying blob member suggests, uh, you know, let's check in in November 2020 and we'll have a better reading. Um, there was, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. So you mentioned earlier about, like, there are a lot of internal problems within the American politics, and my question is about the Congress. So, on the one hand, we're witnessing a trend of bipartisanship in the Congress, and but on the other hand, we're seeing that um, congressmen seem to be less interested in foreign policy making because they can't have a bigger say than the president. Yep. So, um, do you have any um, like views on like which direction that the role of Congress is heading to, or is there any adjustment or improvement can be made to the role of the Congress? Thank you. Well. Uh... 
you know, it's, it's, it's no fun being a member of Congress anymore. Um, they spend all their time raising money. Um, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you constantly feel under attack from the wing of your own party. Um, you know, you're so worried about somebody challenging you in a primary. Um, members of Congress often uh, will say privately, you know, this isn't much fun anymore. Um, the most heartening development that I've seen uh, in terms of what Congress might look like and how politics might be rebuilt in the U.S. Um, is a group called With Honor, which is a group of young veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, served as military or CIA officers uh, in those places. Um, it's strictly bipartisan. The group uh, funds races 50-50, dem Democrat and Republican. Anybody who gets money from them has to sign a, a pledge that they will work across the aisle, that they will be civil, that they'll drop this crazy, you know, um, apocalyptic rhetoric about the other side that's part of what's killing us. And they're fabulous. Um, I, you know, I've written about this group now two or three times. Um, their hope is that over time they'll have um, critical mass in the House that they, they now have, I think, roughly 20 members that they've elected. It's pretty big. Uh, their hope is if they get up to like 30 or 35, then they begin to be a group that you have to, to bargain with. And as I say, it, they're pretty much equally split between, the, uh, between Republicans and Democrats. You look at the Democrats who were put by Pelosi on the House Armed Services Committee, uh, it's an amazing group. I mean, they're, um, she put nine new members on. I think you know, seven or eight of them are uh, these young veterans. Uh, maybe five are women. It's just it, so, um, you know, and they've got similar younger Republicans on that committee. Um, so anyway, it's, it's just worth looking at in this period where it's so easy to be pessimistic about the political fundamentals. There are some things like this that, that I find encouraging. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Chitra Kamchalani, also a Masters of Journalism student. Uh, I think when we when we look at politics and economics, there it's difficult to separate the, the two, um, it, as well as for foreign policy and economics. Um, just I want to understand what is the impression in Washington about you know Trump is maybe trying to step off the world stage, looking more inwards at domestic issues, but at the same time, was this was the was these sanctions on China a way for a smart move that actually Trump made in order to try and you know by hitting China um, and uh, and their economic <coughs> might, maybe their political might be might might uh, may also be controlled. So um, I I don't know that he has a strategic idea about about weakening China. There are people around him who, I mean, he has some very hawkish advisors. Peter Navarro basically, you know, is a, you know, stridently, you know, concerned about Chinese power. And uh, Trump ha has, has been, um, as he says, a proponent of tariffs. Um, somebody's convinced that the rest of the world is you know, stealing us blind in terms of trade and foreign and defense policy for, for decades. I mean, it's really, these are old themes for him. I, you know, the, the simple answer to your question is he, ne he doesn't strike me as being strategic in how he thinks about these things. Um, you know, he has a few baseline ideas. He holds on to them. You know, I mean, he's determined to build that wall. I, you know, it's crazy as it sounds. I'd be amazed if it doesn't end up being built by... November 2020, um, but in terms of a, a systematic, strategic idea of where he wants to end up with China, I haven't seen it yet. Let me take one more question. Uh, yes, sir. I'm Peter, first year graduate student at JMSC. 
Um, do you think China will continue to move toward an authoritarian form of capitalism in the mode of Singapore? And if China succeeds in bringing more people out of poverty over the next, say, 30 to 40 years, um, will it provide the world with another paradigm or another blueprint of how a society can be run other than a, a democratic form of capitalism that we have in the U.S.? Um, again, a good question, a good, a good last question. A lot of people would say that that alternative model already exists. That when people look at a chaotic, politically somewhat dysfunctional U.S., has this terrible problem of gun violence, doesn't seem to be able to do anything about it. Every week there's another shooting. I mean, it, people say that, that is, that's a model that just isn't as attractive as we thought. So let's re-examine or examine the Chinese alternative, this um, you know, fairly disciplined under Xi party machinery, um, seems to have competent people at different levels uh, administratively. I think you're being a little charitable in, in likening it to Singapore. I, I think Singapore is Singapore and China have have elements that are similar. But um, uh, you know, if, if Xi Jinping was headed toward where Lee Kuan Yew wanted to head, I'd feel a little better about about things. I'm not I'm not convinced of that. But but I think you put the question uh, just right. I, I'll close where I began. Um, so it's pretty amazing. You know, if you're an American and you you know you you're really worried about where our country is going, but even more, you're worried that this democratic experiment, which you know we um, you know we didn't begin it, but we certainly have been the dominant exponent of um, since our revolution. It, it feels like that um, mode of of government has been um, in trouble. Uh, losing support uh, around the world, you know, just um, beginning to unravel. So coming here, and I don't know, I have no ideas, I, but nobody in this whole room has any idea of how these uh, protests um, in Hong Kong are going to end up. Um, but it's pretty exciting, even with the crazy ninja kids you know, at the end of the evening to see basically most Hong Kongers say, you know, we want to, we want one country, two systems. We don't, we want our own values. We want, I mean, you know, that's, um, it's, it's exhilarating. So uh, I, there are a lot of things to be depressed about in the world. I, I have found this visit to Hong Kong um, encouraging, and I hope that that's the way it feels for all of you being here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for being a terrific audience and for asking terrific questions. Thank you again to the U.S. Consulate General for Hong Kong and Macau uh, for the funding to make this possible. And please keep an eye on our website and our Twitter feed, JMSC HKU, and our, uh, other great speakers and other great events we have coming up. Thank you all.